So, bottom line, I think microglia are the neurophysiologic mandate for integrative medicine. I think microglia tell us that we can no longer look at disease as a causal event, but need to look at it as a process. And we need to be comprehensive in our treatment of these individuals. And failure to do so will result in failure to get resolution of these problems for these people. This has already been documented. If you have chronic pain and if you have uh, chronic and you have uh, a major depressive disorder, one study demonstrates a 9% rate of recovery, an abysmal rate of recovery using conventional medical techniques. We have to be thinking in terms of process and we need to think in terms of integration. What are all the things that we can put together in terms of helping these individuals recover and identifying all of the factors that help them get sick? And so utilizing, uh, addressing all of the etiologies and confounding issues in these people. Meditation. Meditation we know is a neuroregenerative process. We know that we see increased gray matter in the prefrontal cortex. We know that we see regulation of the prefrontal cortex over the amygdala region. So we need to be paying attention to all of the techniques and, and take advantage of all the different types of therapies that can help us get back to normal. Exercise, we know, is neuroregenerative. Paying attention to nutrition and especially making sure the gut is sealed. Sleep disorders, which we've already discussed. The use of medications. In medications, again, we need to be thinking about people who are on proton pump inhibitors are almost guaranteed to be having problems with absorption of magnesium and other micronutrients. People who are chronically taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications have impairment in, uh, in the gut mucosa and create leaky gut problems. All right, so we end up again with micronutrient deficiencies. And we also end up with potentially the beginnings of autoimmune process. Again, another lecture, but an important thing to keep in mind. So we need to be smart about the medications that we're using and how we're utilizing them. Acupuncture. Acupuncture, recent studies in functional MRI have demonstrated that acupuncture also neuroregenerative, also capable of regulating um, the balance on crosstalk between the various centers in the brain. And so acupuncture looks like another promising method in causing neuroreregulation. Psychotherapy. Studies have demonstrated without question that the use of medication and psychotherapy together has a far better outcome in terms of uh, treatment for major depressive disorders and anxiety than the use of uh, medication alone. And so we need to make sure that uh, this is incorporated into our, our therapeutic processes and physical therapy. We've got to make sure that the joints are all working. We have to eliminate uh, the issues of peripheral input coming into the system. And so all the neuromuscular problems uh, need to be addressed uh, as well as what we're paying attention to centrally. So we're looking at all the different inputs that are coming in. We're looking at all the different problems and we're trying to find how we take out each individual problem to get a more com comprehensive solution uh, to each of these individuals suffering with chronic pain, depression, post-traumatic stress syndrome, anxiety disorders, and recent studies demonstrating that chronic fatigue syndrome is also probably part of the central sensitization. This is a huge problem, but we have now the beginnings of the uh, of our neurophysiologic understanding of what's going on with these individuals. And because of that, we have much greater tools available to us in terms of how we can potentially treat these individuals. So we'll go back to our questions. Approximately what percentage of people suffering with depression will have comorbid psychiatric issues? The answer is together class. Please say C. <laughs> All right. The presence of depression in someone suffering with chronic pain is predictive of a poor outcome. True or false? True. Which uh, of these can cause activation of central nervous system microglia, infectious diseases, post-traumatic stress syndrome, heavy metals, traumatic brain injury? Oh. All of And microglia phenotypes include ramified states, activated states, the amoeboid states, and macrophage, or? All Correct. You've done well. We've apparently taught you a little bit while we're here. Any questions? The question is, uh, can uh, low-dose naltrexone and uh, minocycline be useful in treatment of central sensitization syndrome? And the answer is the studies demonstrate that both of these medications down-regulate, they will turn off the functioning of the microglia. So when you have microglia in an activated state, which you have in central sensitization, that uh, through different mechanisms, uh, low dose now tracks on one and a half to four and a half milligrams once a day and uh, minocycline, the dose is not quite understood, probably 50 milligrams 
to 100 milligrams once a day uh, can be uh, helpful in, in the process of as a partial treatment uh, for these individuals. Uh, dextromorphan has also been demonstrated to be useful in downregulation of microglia, and other medications are being looked at as cannabinoids, uh, as I mentioned earlier. So all of these things are, what they're doing is they're quieting the microglia response. They're helping the microglia return to a resting ramified state, uh, and thus stopping the, pro the neurophysiologic process that causes central sensitization. So the question is, how do you wean somebody off uh, opioids who has central sensitization syndrome? And it's a very complex and difficult issue. Uh, in some cases, we can't, and that's what we're stuck with. And use of opioid medications is kind of saying, look, this is the best we can do, but we want to see what we can do in terms of getting the best quality of life. And so the use of those medications uh, is necessary and important in those circumstances. I think that we reach for them perhaps a little too soon, and we're not comprehensive enough in terms of looking for other factors that are uh, coming into play with these individuals. And we need to keep in mind that at the point that we go to opioids, we're probably leaving people on them uh, for life. Uh, and so uh, we want to be very uh, conscientious about uh, what's going on in these individuals. We want to be very clear with them uh, as far as what we're doing with these medications. And we want to use them as judiciously as possible uh, in our treatment program. So the question was about uh, the use of opioids for short-term periods, and specifically in, uh, in utilization for treating the pain associated with uh, uh, prolotherapy, proliferative therapy. And again, remembering that uh, the purpose of proliferative therapy is actually to incite an inflammatory reaction to cause uh, an opportunity for healing uh, to occur within the ligaments and the tendons. And the answer is we don't have any research on it. And so I can't tell you whether or not that's going to create a problem or not long-term. Clinically, it looks like short-term, couple of days uh, use of the opioids is probably not a problem. Uh, but again, you've got to be cognizant of the individual that you're treating, uh, what their pre-existing conditions were, whether or not they already have central sensitization, uh, and, uh, and knowledge that because we now see that microglia have memory function, uh, as we do this repetitively, is this a good idea or not? These are questions that need to be answered. They're important questions. These are questions that need to be answered as we, we move uh, into the future. And they're ones that we need to be paying attention to in, in the clinics as we're treating these individuals.